Keith said, we're going to talk about increasing the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit of the Haas avocado. Now, I've organized my presentation today into four parts. We're going to talk about the proper timing of, of fertilizer applications to increase fruit size. Then we'll take a look at the new uh, optimum leaf nutrient concentrations. We're going to then shift gears a little bit and talk about the use of gibberellic acid, GA3, to increase yield of commercially valuable sized fruit. And then last, we'll talk about pruning to increase fruit size and mitigate the negative effects of a heavy on-crop year. Now, due to the loss of fruit last year as a result of the high temperatures that occurred, the expectations for this year are an on-bloom that will set an on-crop if the weather continues to cooperate that will have small size fruit and that next year will be an off crop year. So the fertilizer and gibberellic acid treatments that I'm gonna to talk to you about today all significantly increased yield of commercially valuable sized fruit. Packing carton sizes 60 plus 48 plus 40s in a good bloom or on bloom on crop year, okay. Now, they do not statistically significantly increase yield when you use them in an off-crop year. And that's because yield is so low that these treatments can increase yield 50% or even double it, but it's not enough to make a statistically significant increase in yield, okay? But if you use the treatments every year, you get a statistically significant cumulative increase in yield, and you get a statistically significant increase in average yield across years, okay? Now, the treatments do not increase the severity of alternate bearing when you increase yield of uh, commercially valuable sized fruit in the on-crop year, okay? So that's very important. We're not making the off-crop year worse. <coughs> now I want to tell you some important characteristics about the on-bloom. First of all, in an on-bloom, 60 to 70% of the inflorescences are produced by last year's summer vegetative shoe flush. 20 to 30 percent were produ are produced by last year's spring vegetative shoots, and 10 percent or less are produced by last year's fall vegetative shoots. So this makes it very clear. In every year, we want to get as many summer vegetative shoots on the tree as we can to have a good bloom the following year. Now there's another interesting aspect of an on bloom, and that is that only summer vegetative shoots produce determinant inflorescences or determinant floral shoots. So you remember that avocados produce two types of floral shoots. They produce determinant ones where that terminal bud ends in a flower, and they produce indeterminant floral shoots where the terminal bud ends in a vegetative shoot. So in good bloom years, because you have a lot of summer shoots contributing to the bloom, you get a high number of these determinant floral shoots. They're born all along the axis of the summer shoot. So if you think of a summer shoot and you think of all the leaves along that shoot, where that leaf is attached is called a node. And at that node is where you find the determinant floral shoots. The indeterminate floral shoot will be at the apex. Now it's well established in all avocado producing countries. And we documented it here in California. Determinant floral shoots set more fruit that persist to harvest. And they also produce larger fruit. So if you're looking for the large fruit on your tree, they're going to be in a determinant floral shoot. The smallest fruit on your tree are going to be produced by the indeterminant floral shoot. Where's my pointer? There. 
Now, uh, next thing I want to do is to dispel this myth that when you increase yield, you get small size fruit. And let me show you this particular figure. The gray bars are total yield per tree. And you can read the yield on the uh, y-axis either here or over here. The black dots are the yield of commercially valuable size fruit. It's very clear that as total yield increases, the yield of commercially valuable size fruit increases. Now what does change is illustrated by these white dots. The proportion of the total yield that is commercially valuable size fruit does decrease, but not a lot. Let's take a look at some facts. So first of all, if you're only producing 22 pounds of fruit per tree, less than 70% of your crop is commercially valuable size fruit. If you bump your yield up all the way to 150 pounds per tree, that's 16,500 pounds per acre. And when I give you yield data per acre, it's always based on 110 trees per acre because that's how the California Avocado Commission likes us to report yield to them from our research. So at 150 pounds per tree, that's the first time the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit drops below 80% of your total yield. That's a pretty big bang for your buck, 80% large size fruit out of your total yield. When you get to 150 pounds of fruit per tree, it drops to about 78%. At that point, you still have 125 pounds of commercially valuable sized fruit per tree. That's 13,750 pounds per acre commercially valuable sized fruit. If we continue to increase yield, you see that it stays about 78, 75% until you get to 250 pounds per tree, that's 27,500 pounds per acre, okay? At that point, you've got about 68% of your total yield is still commercially valuable large size fruit. So that's 160 pounds of commercially valuable size fruit or 17,600 pounds per acre. Now, if you are a really good grower and you can produce 300 pounds per tree, that's 33,000 pounds per acre. I want to meet you, first of all. <laughs> but at that point, the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit is still 66%. That's 200 pounds of commercially valuable sized fruit per tree. That's 22,000 pounds of commercially valuable sized fruit per acre. So let's talk now about properly timing fertilizer applications to increase avocado fruit size. The goal of growers is to increase the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit while reducing production costs. So optimizing your tree nutrient status is a very cost effective strategy for increasing fruit size yield and profit. In my research program, we developed properly timed fertilizer applications as a tool to achieve this goal. You have to fertilize your tree. So let's get some bang for that fertilizer buck. All plants, even avocado trees, require 17 essential elements. Carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen are all gases. So carbon and oxygen are taken up as carbon dioxide, and oxygen is taken up as an oxygen molecule. These two molecules move through the open stomates in your leaves and are used in the processes of photosynthesis and photorespiration, respectively. Photosynthesis and photorespiration produce energy, and the building blocks to produce fruit. These um, oh, hydrogen and oxygen are taken up as water by the roots, 
and dissolved in that water is carbon dioxide and oxygen. So another way that carbon dioxide and oxygen gets into the tree. Now this column of six nutrients are the macronutrients. They are required in relatively large amounts compared to these nine elements, which are the micronutrients. Now, in order for an avocado tree to produce the maximum yield of optimal size fruit, the tree must have adequate amounts of all 17 of these elements throughout its phenology. Now, I'm going to use the term phenology throughout my discussion today, so let me tell you what it is. Phenology is the sequence of developmental events that occur in the production of the crop. So flower formation, flowering itself, fruit set, exponential fruit growth, fruit maturation, those are all phenological stages or phenological events. Flushes of shoot growth and root growth are also phenological stages or phenological events. And so every one of those important stages in crop production needs to have an adequate amount of each of these elements, or the tree cannot produce to the maximum level. And so the nutrient that is lacking, that is, that is only available in a small amount, is called the limiting factor. So let's say that nutrient X is only available at 50% of the amount that's necessary for maximum production of optimal size fruit. That means that the tree can only produce at 50% of its yield potential. The nice thing about limiting factors is their negative effect on productivity is not additive. So you can have multiple limiting factors this tree still produces to the level supported by the minimum amount of material that's there, the most limiting factor. So if we have three limiting factors and one is severely limiting, then the tree can only produce to the level supported by the most severely limiting factor. Limiting factors are exactly that. They're reducing productivity and fruit size. They need to be eliminated. So soil fertilization is an inexpensive strategy for providing essential mineral nutrients to the tree. And if you as growers are judicious in your selection of formula, uh, fertilizer formulations and soil amendments, you can use your fertilization program to correct soil problems. So you can actually improve your soil structure. You can mitigate the negative effects of salinity. You can correct a pH problem in your soil. You can increase the water holding capacity of your soil, promote a pathogen suppressive rhizosphere, and even unplug your irrigation emitters if you use something like phosphorus acid or N-furic. Now, there are problems associated with soil fertilization, and that's because there are many factors that affect the root's ability to take up nutrients from the soil. A classic example is what is happening this spring. We have cold, wet soils. That compromises the ability of the tree's roots to take up nutrients. And so because there are many factors that impact uh, the nutrient uptake by the roots, it's difficult to know when soil applied fertilizers are actually taken up and how much is taken up over a given period of time relative to how much has already leached past the root zone and is no longer available to the roots. So it's very hard with soil fertilization sometimes to know if you are meeting the nutrient demand of the tree. And this is one of the advantages of foliar fertilization. It's a rapid, efficient strategy for providing essential mineral nutrient elements directly to the leaves to overcome the soil's inability to release nutrients to the roots or the roots' inability to take up nutrients. So when you apply a foliar fertilizer to the leaves, 
you know that the nutrients are taken up within hours to days. And because the leaves house the photosynthetic and basal metabolism machinery of the tree, then you are ensuring that there are no limiting factors. Now, foliar fertilizers should be used to rapidly correct nutrient deficiencies. So if you have symptoms of nutrient deficiencies visible on your tree, or if your tissue analyses indicate that a nutrient concentration is at the low end of the optimal range, or is actually in the deficient range, then you want to use foliar fertilizers to quickly correct that problem. If soil analysis reveals a problem that affecting the nutrients uh, availability to the roots, like a pH problem, you need to supply the nutrients to the leaves while you're correcting the problem in the soil. Now, imp to improve the efficiency or efficacy of foliar applied fertilizer uptake, you should apply the foliar fertilizers when the leaves are one half to two thirds expanded. So at this stage of leaf development, the cuticle, that waxy layer that protects the leaf, is relatively thin and so nutrients move easily into the leaves. Also, the leaf is large enough that a sufficient amount of fertilizer gets into the leaf so you can get a good physiological response. So you actually have three opportunities in the phenology of the tree to apply foliar fertilizers to leaves at one half to two thirds expansion. So your spring flush, when the bulk of the leaves are expanding, your summer flush, and you could even do it at your fall flush if you had a real problem. Fall flush is usually not big enough to provide enough tissue to get the foliar, foliar fertilizer in. But in a critical event, you could use that as well. So the goal of um, my research program's approach to fertilization is to obtain an economic advantage from the application of a foliar or soil fertilizer. And we do this by identifying the role that nutrients play in the physiology of the crop. And then we apply a nutrient as a foliar or soil applied fertilizer at a key stage in the phenology of the tree to stimulate a very specific metabolic process that will increase yield, fruit size, or fruit quality, and therefore increase grower income even when the tree is not deficient by standard leaf analysis. So we're not simply correcting a nutrient deficiency, we're actually applying the fertilizer at a time to support a very important physiological process during a very important stage in phenology so that we increase fruit size or increase yield and therefore increase income. So the goal of our approach is to target periods of high nutrient demand. In addition, for our foliar fertilizers, we target periods of high nutrient demand that occur when soil conditions reduce nutrient uptake by the roots. So the goal is to obtain a plant growth regulator-like effect from a foliar or soil applied fertilizer that increases fruit set, increases fruit size or fruit quality, and increases grower income. So in our approach to fertilization, properly timing the fertilizer applications is critical. Now, this figure illustrates uh, periods of high nutrient demand in the phenology of the avocado tree in California. Now, I apologize if the months on this uh, x-axis do not correlate exactly with these stages of phenology in your orchard. This is a ballpark to get you thinking about the right times of the year. These shift every year, so based on weather, okay? And also in an on-crop year, bloom always starts earlier. But we don't fertilize by month. That's just 
a shorthand to kind of focus us. We fertilize according to tree phenology. So even though I have three circles on this diagram, there are really only two periods of high nutrient demand that we need to pay attention to. The first is in the spring. So we have the bloom that we have to support. We have fruit set that we need to support. And we have spring shoot growth. And we want to support spring shoot growth because those spring shoots will produce summer shoots which are going to give us a good return bloom. The second period is summer. And summer is very important. We have exponential fruit growth. That's where we get our size. We have our first root flush, which we need to uh, protect. And then we have our summer shoots, which are going to contribute 60 to 70% of our bloom next year. Now, this third circle is to remind you that in California, we have mature fruit on the tree in the spring. So spring becomes very complicated because we have bloom, we have spring shoots, we have fruit set, and now we got to deal with the mature fruit on the tree. So when we have an off bloom year, we have an on mature crop on the tree, and it has needs that have to be met. In the on bloom year, we have the off crop on the tree. That's not so critical because it doesn't have such a high demand for nutrients. Now, these figures that I'm going to show you in the next three slides illustrate when young developing fruit and mature fruit take up nutrients. So you can see here that the young developing fruit are taking up nutrients from the point of fruit set but the major uptake is from July into September. And this time, the fruit take up about 500 milligrams of nitrogen. Then there's no uptake through the cold months. And it's, and it's not even just cold, because it's not really cold in October or November. But the fruit are just not growing that much. They're not strong sinks, and they're not taking up nutrients. So there's no need to fertilize through any of this period of time. The next time you need to think about fertilizing to support the fruit is in the spring, when the mature fruit, again, start taking up nutrients from approximately April through June. We need to support that growth. And so for nitrogen, they use an equal amount of nitrogen in the, in the summer and then the following spring as mature fruit. So keep in mind, if you have uh, information like this and a crop estimate, you can calculate approximately how much nitrogen is needed to support the developing fruit when they're young and when they're mature. This is potassium. It has the same uptake pattern. It's just that mature fruit take up a lot more than the young fruit. So again, from July into September, we see a significant uptake of potassium, about 500 milligrams per fruit. <coughs> Same amount as nitrogen. There's a little bit that looks like it's going on through the winter. Ignore it. It's not enough to make any kind of difference. So you don't have to fertilize during this period of time. But then in April through June again, we get a big increase in potassium moving into the fruit. There's actually threefold more potassium taken up by the mature fruit than the young developing fruit. But in the end, there's about twofold more potassium than nitrogen. And this is calcium. I show you this one because calcium is only taken up by the young developing fruit. Very small amount, about 40, less than 40 milligrams per fruit. So it's not a lot of calcium. But the important thing is that to maintain good fruit quality, which is reliant on calcium in your fruit. You must get all that calcium into the fruit from July through September, OK? So small amounts with every irrigation. Why with irrigation? Because calcium moves into the roots right behind the root tip. And then it's carried in the transpiration stream in the xylem up throughout the rest of the tree and into the fruit. Okay. 
Your stomates must be open and they must be transpiring. That means water is escaping as a gas out of the leaves. It's evaporating out of the leaves. The only time that can happen is when your trees have adequate water. The most at times that it happens is when you're irrigating, okay? So if you put the calcium in with each irrigation, right up into the tree, and you'll be sure of supplying the calcium that the fruit needs for good fruit quality. Yes. Can you dose it in through the whole irrigation cycle, or do you just put it in the last couple hours? You should put it on uh, in the last couple of hours, because that's when the roots start taking it up, OK? Yeah. It, they don't really take it up when they're being flooded. But out, when it's there in the soil and the soil is moist, the calcium will stay in solution and be taken up by the roots. OK, let's look at some examples of properly timed foliar applied fertilizers that increase yield and yield of commercially valuable sized fruit. Now, I'm sure that most of you have heard me talk about um, canopy applied boron or urea. So boron is applied at 1.3 to 1.4 pounds per acre of boron, and urea is low by urea at 22 to 25 pounds of nitrogen per acre. It's applied at the cauliflower stage of inflorescence development. You put it on in about 200 to 250 gallons of water if you're doing a ground application. It should be applied like a pesticide spray. You want good mixing. You've got to make sure that you get the spray onto the developing inflorescence. We trunk injected trees, and we could increase the boron concentration of the leaves more with the trunk injection than we could with the canopy spray. But we didn't get any increase in yield because the boron was not on the flowers, OK? You spray your trees when 50% of the block has 50% of the trees with their bloom at the cauliflower stage. That means that on some of the trees, 25% of the bloom will be at an earlier stage, closer to bud break, probably that round ball stage. And 25% of the trees will have bloom that's closer to full bloom. Now, I'm going to skip two slides ahead because I want to show you that if you can't get into your orchard, it's better to be late. In other words, closer to full bloom than closer to bud break. And so this cauliflower stage that's starting to expand, this still gives you a good response. So this window, 50% of the tree between this stage on 50% of the trees in the orchard. Now, you've probably heard me talk about what's going on developmentally, physiologically, in a cauliflower stage inflorescence. This is when the final stages of pollen development are occurring, and also the final stages in ovule development. The ovule contains the egg. So if you remember, to produce an avocado fruit, the pollen has to land on the stigma of the flower produce a pollen tube that grows all the way down to the ovule and deliver the sperm to the egg. When the sperm and egg fuse, then we get a little tiny avocado tree. The ovule transitions to the seed, and the carpal, the base of the flower, becomes the fruit. So applying boron and urea at the cauliflower stage of inflorescence development actually increases the number of pollen grains that have landed on the stigma. It causes an increased number to germinate. They germinate, they produce this pollen tube, and it increases the number of pollen tubes that actually penetrate the ovule. So you can see boron significantly increase the number of pollen tubes penetrating the ovule compared to untreated control. It was better than urea, and the combination of the two was not any better than boron alone. We also were able to document that um, 
boron and urea increased the number of viable ovules. So all of these were equally effective in increasing ovule viability. So this, the brown ones are viable ovules because they can exclude a fluorescent dye. This is a dead ovule that could not keep the dye out. This is one that's dying. You can see the, the dye is getting in. So if we increase the number of pollen tubes that are delivering uh, sperm to more viable ovules with more viable eggs, this translates to an increase in yield. So boron resulted in a net increase in total yield of 12,125 pounds per acre, that's per 110 trees, for three years. So that's, a, that's more than 4,000 pounds averaged across the three years. Urea was uh, slightly less effective at 11,000 pounds uh, per acre over the three years. So slightly under 4,000 pounds per year. The important part is that this treatment resulted with 50% of that net increase in yield being commercially valuable large size fruit. Now I put this slide in because those of you that have heard, heard, heard me talk about using boron urea know that you must pick one or the other, you cannot combine them. It's not an interaction in the tank mix. It's an interaction between boron, urea, and the cauliflower stage in fluorescence. And it results in double stigmas, double styles, double ovaries, fused ovaries, and an ovule in each one. These malformed uh, carpels abscise from the tree doesn't result in a statistically significant loss in yield in a given year. But if you did it year after year after year, you would have a cumulative negative effect. So don't do it. Pick one or pick the other. Now, this is a perfect year to use either one. Boron is most effective when conditions are not optimal for fruit set not optimal for bee activity. So this wet, rainy year, bees aren't going anywhere. And this is where you see the best effect of boron. When everything is optimal for fruit set, the, the boron doesn't have a significant effect. This is also a good year for urea because I doubt that we're gonna have very high temperatures uh, immediately following an application at the cauliflower stage this year. So because of the cold wet soils, our trees are not getting a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. So supplying the nitrogen to the bloom has a lot of advantages this year. So I also want to point out another reason not to do this because we just got an abscission of the flowers and no decrease in yield in the current year. But a, a student of mine, Dr. Samuel Salazar Garcia, repeated our research in Mexico. And when he combined the boron and the urea, he got four carpels per flower. And he got a significant reduction in yield of three metric tons per hectare each year. So maybe the situation would be worse if you do it, so don't do it. Now, because the cauliflower stage of inflorescence development seems to be very responsive to treatments, we decided to try a canopy application of potassium phosphate or potassium phosphite. In this experiment, the control was soil applied potassium phosphate, 10 pounds per acre of phosphorus, 19 pounds per acre of potassium. And we compared foliar applied potassium phosphate with foliar applied potassium phosphite. 0.7 pounds of phosphorus, 1.3 pounds uh, per acre of potassium. In this experiment, only the foliar applied potassium phosphite provided a yield benefit. 
the fully applied potassium phosphite increased the yield of commercially valuable sized fruit by 4,262 pounds per acre over three years. So about 1,400 pounds per acre averaged across the three years. This treatment actually reduced the yield of fruit of size 72 or smaller, so there was no significant net increase in total yield. There was a numerical increase in total yield, but it was not statistically significant. So you don't lose total yield, you get rid of the small size fruit. And again, my student Samuel Salazar Garcia repeated this in Mexico with a very similar result, an increase in commercially valuable size fruit and a reduction in the yield of small fruit, smaller than size 70 in Mexico. Let's take a look now at some examples of properly timed soil applied fertilizers that increase total yield and yield of commercially valuable size fruit. Since fruit number drives the uptake of many essential nutrients from the soil, matching fertilizer rates and application times to periods of high nutrient demand by the fruit and also periods of strong canopy growth, whether it's floral or vegetative, and root activity makes sense for optimizing tree nutrient status. When you apply a fertilizer to the soil during a period of high nutrient demand, a greater amount of that fertilizer is taken up. So that increases uh, fertilizer use efficiency, it increases your cost benefit from your fertilizer application because you're getting more of it into the tree and less is leaching past the root zone and unavailable to the tree. And because less is leaching past the root zone and becoming unavailable, oops, we're protecting the environment as well. And that's something as growers we want to do. So, Matching fertilizer application times and rates to high periods of nutrient demand. In this experiment, um, this was done at a time where there was a lot of concern about nitrate contamination of the groundwater. And so growers were being advised to divide their annual uh, nitrogen application into small doses and apply them every month or every other month. That did not take into account any periods of high nutrient demand in the tree. That was fertilization by calendar, not what the tree needed. And so we asked the question, if we were to provide the tree with double doses of nitrogen in some months, would we get a yield benefit? And so that's what we did. Now we double dosed in some months that didn't provide a yield benefit, but if you double dose in April or November, you get a net increase in total yield of 20,000 pounds per 110 trees per acre, or a net increase in commercially valuable sized fruit of 17,000 pounds per 110 trees per acre for four years. And these treatments actually reduce the yield of fruit that were 72s or smaller and they reduced the severity of alternate bearing. In other words, they tended to even out the yield over these four years. And it makes sense. Double dosing in April, especially because we're working with on-crop on years in some years, we're supporting the bloom, we're supporting fruit set, and we're supporting that spring shoot growth, which will develop summer shoots, which will improve bloom the following year. November, the uh, principle behind double dosing in November was to load the tree with nutrients, nitrogen, for next year's bloom. So um, one of the things that happens is that in the fall, trees produce a uh, root flush that is actually a storage root. It's very similar to grapevines. And so what we are trying to do is get that root flush loaded with nitrogen for next year's bloom. Now, we have since learned that you can shift that November application 
to about September, October, especially in an on-crop year, to continue to support exponential fruit growth, to support fall shoots that will contribute 10% to the return bloom, and also support that root flush, which occurs at the end of September, beginning of October, and get the nitrogen into that flush. And one of the reasons we wanted to push it backwards, um, in addition to meeting these periods of growth, is so we don't push a fall flush that would be sensitive to frost damage. Now, we did a follow-up experiment. Um, actually, we did several. But one of the ones we did was we asked ourselves, could we have gotten an even better response to that double dose of nitrogen if we had also supplied phosphorus and potassium. So our reasoning was that we put all this nitrogen on, but what if phosphorus and potassium were limiting factors? And so the tree wasn't responding to the nitrogen as much as it could. So again, we had um, applications of nitrogen uh, every other month from April to November. And then we had trees that got nitrogen and phosphorus uh, every month. And we supplied it uh, in different sets of trees. So one set of tree got nitrogen in April and a double dose. And then it got phosphorus and potassium with it. So that would be like a third set of trees. What we learned in this experiment is that the optimal time for supplying nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium was in the summer. We put this treatment on, 25 pounds of nitrogen, 3.75 pounds per acre of phosphorus, and 22 pounds of potassium per acre in July and again in August. And we got the greatest yields out of all of the treatments that we had. Another thing that we learned was that when we supplied phosphorus and potassium, at the other times of the year, we got a reduction in yield. This was the only time when we put the phosphorus and potassium with the nitrogen that we got a significant increase in yield. The other thing we learned was that, which will be helpful, if you have high nitrogen in your orchard and you want to back off the nitrogen, if you supply the nitrogen only in July and August, you maintain high yields. The other thing we learned was if you supply single doses of nitrogen, but apply it in all the right months around, to support spring um, uh, periods of high nutrient demand, so around April, July, August, and then September, October region to support fall shoot flush, exponential fruit growth, and that fall um, root flush, you get good yields um, year after year also. So by supplying nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in July and August, we got a net increase in total yield of 10,000 uh, pounds per 110 trees per acre in three years. And of that, 6,600 pounds were uh, commercially valuable size fruit. So 66% of the fruit were commercially valuable sized fruit. And so in the double dosing of nitrogen in April and November, and in this experiment, we increased the proportion of commercially valuable sized fruit. I think that's all there. So again, I have three boxes up here, but there are really only two times of the year where you have to make critical decisions about your fertilization program. Because we're fertilizing to meet nutrient demand of the tree. So the first is spring. If it's an off bloom, then you can back off your fertilization program a bit because you have an off bloom, you're going to have a good set, and you already have good amount of spring shoot growth. In an on-crop year, you must up your fertilization to meet the demands of the on-bloom. Flowering is a very high nutrient demand process. Fruit set. 
We're going to have a large fruit set. We don't want to compromise fruit set or the initiation of fruit growth. And we want to make sure we get all those spring shoots so that we can get bloom the next year. In the summer of an off-crop year, there's a few fruit on the tree, so they're going to be nice, large-sized fruit. We're going to have good summer vegetative shoot growth that's going to produce an on bloom the next year. So again, you can back off on your fertilization, save a little bit of money. In an on-crop year, we need to up the game a bit. We need to support exponential fruit growth. We want to make sure that we're stimulating all the vegetative shoot growth we can get because that's going to be our flowers for next year. Now where it becomes complicated is that in the off-bloom year, we have a heavy on-crop of mature fruit on the tree. These fruit have a high demand. So we have to support these fruit, especially if they haven't attained size. We've got to make sure they get their size up. They probably already have reached adequate dry matter. I encourage you to get these fruit off the tree. Make your life simple. Manage just the current year's crop. But every time you make fertilizer decisions, especially in the spring, you have to think about meeting the demands of your current crop, your last year's crop, and your next year's crop. So we have to support flowering and set. We have to support vegetative shoot growth in an on-crop year in order to get good bloom the next year. And in an off-bloom year, we have to take care of that mature on-crop on the tree. But if you can harvest and get them off the tree, that's beneficial. Because later on in this presentation, I'm going to show you what happens if you keep that on crop of fruit on the tree trying to bump up its size. Okay, let's take a look at the new optimum leaf nutrient concentration ranges that were put up on the California Avocado Commission website. So I want to make sure that you understand that these uh, new optimum leaf concentration ranges are based on Embleton's classic way of collecting leaves. So these were leaves collected from non-fruiting, non-flushing terminal spring flush shoots, and they were collected between August and October. So it's the same thing that Embleton has always recommended. It might surprise you that in California, so experiments were only conducted for nitrogen, iron, and zinc to determine the optimal leaf concentration for maximum yield. These experiments did not address fruit size or fruit quality. So other than nitrogen, iron, and zinc, all the other optimal concentration ranges that are being recommended for all the other nutrients were simply borrowed from citrus and applied to avocado. And so what's happened over the years uh, the, is that the different labs that do leaf analysis started changing the optimal concentration ranges based on what they saw their growers were getting for yield. And so the situation became one where different labs are now recommending that growers use different leaf concentrations as optimal. Okay. So growers were beginning to wonder, what do we do? If you know what another lab is recommending versus your lab, who's correct? And so it was time to take a new look at what should be the optimal concentrations. Also, from when Embleton did these first analyses, we fertilized very differently than we did then. So this research was conducted using multiple comprehensive data sets. I was part of this research. I had a data set that was over a 20-year period. So I told you you can do a lot when you get old. I had a 20-year data set that included leaf analyses for all of those nutrients you see there. It also included total yield, 
fruit size distribution from less than 84 all the way through greater than size 32s. We had fruit quality data. This came from multiple orchards in all of these growing areas. Okay. And so you can see that these orchards were all distributed through the major avocado growing areas of the state. We used multiple statistical approaches to identify leaf nutrient concentrations related to high yields and high yields of commercially valuable sized fruit. So in this table, here's the list of nutrients, here's their concentrations. This is Embleton's um, ranges that he suggested. So keep in mind that a lot of these are very broad ranges because they came from citrus and it wasn't quite clear what avocados really should have. And these new concentrations are here. And then this is the concentration ranges that were found in the bulk of all of those orchards that were included in the study. Now, I put 2.9 in red. The range that was put up on the Avocado Commission website is from 2.25 to 2.9 for nitrogen. I believe very strongly based on the data in the experiment, and a few things I'm going to tell you right now, you can make your own judgment, that 2.9 is too high. First of all, there's a dramatic yield reduction when nitrogen exceeds 3.0. This is too close to 3.0. If you are at this high end and you fertilize and you go above it, you're going to be into the range that reduces yield. Also, if you have any chloride in your orchard, the best yields, if you have high chloride, more than 30 parts per million, going up to 60 parts per million, you need to be between 2.25 and 2.5. 2.9 will give you a yield reduction if you've got chloride in your irrigation water and in your soil. And as you'll see in a subsequent uh, slide I show you, maximum yield in this data set was for trees that had 2.25 to 2.5 percent nitrogen. So that's why I like this range. Now let's take a look at how we're doing as growers in terms of fertilization. And you, you can run through your mind your own levels, but here's what we found in that data set. So growers are doing a good job with nitrogen. 2.25 to 2.7 was in the bulk of all the orchards in that data set. Pota uh, phosphorus is at 0.15, so upper end of the new optimal range, and that's good. You just be careful that you don't go way over. Uh, potassium is at 0.9, again, the upper end of that range, so very good, just don't go over. Calcium was low. Uh, it was in the middle of Ambleton's range, but it's, it's too low by the new ranges that are associated with high yields. Magnesium was at the low end or below. Sulfur was way below. Uh, zinc is way below. Manganese is way below. Iron is good, it's at the low end of the range, so again, caution that it doesn't drop below the range. Boron was very low, and a surprise to us is that copper was too high. We cannot identify where the copper is coming from unless it's in the irrigation water or there's something about our soils that we never knew before. But we don't know of many growers that are applying copper sprays to control anything. So um, this is something that we're looking into to see where this copper is coming from. So uh, in general, there's this very high copper that suggests over-fertilization that we know is not happening. It's coming from some source. Phosphorus and potassium are on the high end on the, on the majority of orchards in California, so that needs to be watched. The majority of orchards are under fertilizing for calcium, sulfur, zinc, manganese, and boron. So these are limiting factors that have to be corrected. 
manganese, uh, uh, magnesium and iron are on the low end, so that needs to be watched so it doesn't drop and become a limiting factor. So nutrient deficiencies, limiting factors, they need to be corrected. Soil or foliar fertilizer applications. The highest yields in the data set were associated with nitrogen at 2.5%, so that's why that's my favorite value. Uh, phosphorus between 0.12 uh, and 0.15%, 15%. Potassium at 0.9%. So potassium does need to be at the high end of that range. Okay. Um, one other thing about the nitrogen, for best post-harvest quality of the fruit, especially if any of you are ever going to ship fruit anywhere, you want to have your nitrogen between 2.4 and 2.5 percent. That gives the best shelf life uh, for the fruit. Now the low yields were associated with nitrogen greater than 3 percent, phosphorus greater than 0.2 percent, and potassium at 1.2 percent, so very high levels. Okay, so are there any questions about fertilization at this point? No, boron is very safe for application with bees in the orchard, yes, and urea is also. So let, let's talk about, because that's a good question. There, there is something physiologically happening in the tree, okay? But competition, you know, especially spring, the April double dosing, that is exactly why we did that double dosing in April. This idea that if you put on a lot of fertilizer in the spring and push vegetative shoot growth, especially in the indeterminate floral shoot, that you're going to cause fruit drop? Let's, let's, let's think about this. First of all, that myth, and it's a myth, came from a paper by Kalmer and Lahav. They never did any research demonstrating that that happens. They just suggested it. They said, oh wow, if we push that growth, we're gonna cause the fruit to drop off. Now, let's think about this. You and your brother are sitting at the table and I give you a thin slice of cake and I said, enjoy guys. I mean, you're gonna fight like cats and dogs over that piece. That's competition. If I give you a whole cake and I say, enjoy, you've got more than you want. You aren't even gonna eat the whole cake. And that's the purpose of double dosing in April. It's to make sure the demands of every organ on that tree are met that we can support the fruit, we can support vegetative shoot growth, and we want to drive vegetative shoot growth in an on-crop year. We need those shoots for next year's bloom. So that's the whole point. When you have competition and negative effects is when you don't have enough of something. That's when you get the negative effects. Okay, and that's why you need to correct any nutrient deficiencies. You don't have enough. Something's going to starve. Something bad is going to happen. Something's going to drop off. Probably what's going to happen is you're going to have fruit drop and no spring or summer vegetative shoot growth. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, the tree will take up either one. Okay, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, some people don't like uh, ammonia formulations because of volatilization. You will change the microflora in your soil depending upon which you use. And you also should take a look at your pH because if you use more ammoniacal versus nitrate, you are shifting your pH. So you should look at that. The ideal pH is around 6, 6, 6.5. That's when the bulk of most nutrients can be taken up by the roots. No. So let's talk about some of the things that impact the ability of the tree's roots to take up nutrients. 
So first of all, every nutrient that's taken up has to be in solution. Okay, so if you're, if you're putting on a ground, dry application of fertilizer, it's got to get dissolved. It's got to get washed into the root zone. It's got to be dissolved be, to be taken up. So here's a way to improve effic efficacy. Pick a fertilizer formulation that's more soluble. Don't put something in that's going to be precipitate and sit in the soil because if it doesn't dissolve, the roots can't take it up. Okay, so um, pH affects solubility. So that's why you have to have a pH that allows what you're putting in to dissolve. Temperature. I talked about cold, wet soils. We got lots of water there, but the soils are cold. First of all, things don't dissolve as well when they're cold. And secondly, roots are not as active when it's cold. So there's a lot of things going on in the soil that affect your nutrients, uh, the tree's ability to take up the nutrients you apply. So liquids are good. Just put the liquid in the right time of your irrigation. The same if you're putting on a dry formulation. You don't want to put it on where then your, your irrigation is so long that you've washed it past the root zone. You have to time it to wash it into the top 12 inches or so of your soil where your roots are, okay? Same with a liquid, it's the same principle. You can't put it in with the whole irrigation, it'll go right by your roots. No, as long as you're using low biuret urea, no. And that you've got it at the right pH. So foliars ought to be at a pH between um, five and six. I say 5.5 .5 plus or minus 0 0.5, okay? For um, urea, you need to at least be at 5.5 .5 because otherwise it goes into ammonia and you're just losing it. So, yeah, citric acid is the best thing because it's very gentle. If you use phosphoric acid or something like that, you know, a little bit and wham, you've shot your pH and you got to do something else to bring it back. Citric acid, nice and gentle, and you know what? Your tree can use it. So use citric acid. No, that's not a problem. So the, the cauliflower stage thing is about cauliflower stage inflorescences and having the urea and the boron on those inflorescences at the same time. We don't know what the interaction is. Obviously, no one's going to pay us to find out, but it's a very interesting interaction. But if you come back, um, you know, say when your leaves are at two-thirds full expansion, which should be about two to three weeks later, and you put one or the other on, it's not going to be a problem. Boron applied to the soil is fine because if you're correcting a nutrient deficiency. As I said earlier, we trunk injected trees at the cauliflower stage of inflorescence development. We were able to pump up the boron level significantly more than that canopy spray does, but it did not increase yield because that at the cauliflower stage, the, the effect is due to the boron getting on the inflorescence. Okay. Now, there, there was a researcher that many of you down in this area probably know, um, an avocado grower, Warren Currier, and he wanted to develop the use of the, of the flower uh, as a, to have boron analyses done. In other words, to figure out what is the amount of boron you need in that flower for good fruit set. And so there are um, countries where they're working on this now, trying to figure out what is the level of boron um, that you need. Uh, so this is sort of part and parcel of that. This was the first information saying, wow, boron needs to be in that flower in order to have a good effect. So eventually we'll know, and you'll be able to analyze your flowers and make sure that you have adequate amount of boron. So, Correcting a deficiency, soil is great. Putting it on through the soil and having good levels in your tree may be adequate. But what we saw was when we put the boron on all the cauliflower stage of inflorescence development, 
We didn't do it to boron deficient trees. We did it to trees that had le adequate levels of boron. And we got a response. And just like I told you in my introduction, these are put on to push specific physiological processes, pollen tube growth, ovule viability, even though the trees had adequate boron or adequate nitrogen.